Presentations when the speaker comes up. Okay, yeah. And then I just need to know, and there's Kirsten. Okay. Yes. And then uh, we're going to bring our bios, and Kirsten's got the bios. Yeah, we can um, Yes, yeah. Okay. I need to give everything to Ms. Guy. There you go. And then I'm not introducing them. Oh, Doug. Okay. okay. And we're just waiting for Doug to load his presentation. Then. Okay. Make sure you want to just give us the thumbs up when you want to start. Okay. Well, I'm kind of aware of the time. Mm -hmm. and people are still piling in. I know 8 o'clock is a bit brutal. Right? <laughs> it's well, that's fairly brutal. normal for conferences, actually. Is it? Okay. I, I, I think that's I mean, brutal. <laughs> <laughs> for me, too. I'm not going to All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, as you probably know by now, my name is uh, Dr. Jenny Moore, and I'm the uh, Director of Institute Sustainability at British Columbia Institute of Technology, and I am the Program Convener for this edition of EcoCity World Summit. So welcome to the beginning of the main summit program. Before we proceed, I'd like to make the following safety announcements. In case of an emergency, please inform staff who will be able to help um, provide assistance. There is a first aid office located next to the registration desk, and washrooms are located at various places around the venue. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on, gathered today on the unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth nations. You know, hosting a World Summit takes a lot of work, and I'd like to acknowledge today that we have 60 volunteers helping us over the course of the week. Our program committee, comprising people from around the world, have worked hard for two years to bring you this amazing program, and I hope you take every advantage of it. Our program committee comprises Adele Farid, Aparjan Thanathamnan, Andre Confiato, Sharon Gill, Sahara Tia, and Rick Smith. Please take a moment to read their bios on the conference website. I'm sure you can appreciate the diversity of where they come from, from civil society, public sector, private sector, all eco city builders in their own right. We've also engaged the efforts of a local organizing committee, including our host city, the city of Vancouver, represented by our sustainability office, Director Doug Smith, supported by Brad Bedelt, the assistant director of sustainability, and Jennifer Wall. Science World, represented by Andrea Durham, and the Vancouver International Airport, represented by Wendy Avis, and finally City Hive, represented by Veronica Belicki. And Veronica is leading a youth idea jam around the Eco City standards, and she'll be reporting out on that with one of their um, youth caucus representatives at the end of the week. A British Columbia Institute of Technology steering committee comprising staff from the School of Construction and the Environment, our lead group at the school at BCIT who brought the summit to Vancouver, is responsible um, for working tirelessly to make this happen. I can't say enough of how appreciative I am of them. It's nice to be up here on the stage getting all the glory, but it's really thanks to them that we're here at all. The people who are uh, 
really do a debt of gratitude are Wayne Hand, the Dean of the School of Business and Construction, Marita Luke, our Business Development Manager, Lori Terrian from Industry Services Manager, Sarah Campbell, the Sustainability Program Manager, Andrea Dussange, Administrative Assistant, and Monica McCormick, the school's past operations manager. And then there are you, our delegates. You are why we are here. You are the leaders from your communities who have come from far corners of the earth to share and learn. And as I reflect on Paul Hawkins' message last night, I think all of us are here really out of love. It's because we love each other, it's because we love the earth, it's why we make the effort. So as you're mixing up today in the coffee breaks or sitting in dialogue with each other, just remember, you love each other. We all love each other, that's why we're here, that's why we do this work. Travel to the summit has generated 1,154 tons of CO2 emissions. Through voluntary purchases of offsets, we have reduced this amount equivalent to all the North American travel, which represents about half the people in the room today, half our delegates. And in lieu of speakers' gifts, we have also made a donation to purchase additional carbon offsets. So for every speaker that's here, thank you. Uh, we have also made an additional contribution to offset the emissions. This beautiful Vancouver Convention Center that we are in for this summit operates on hydropower and is 100% emissions free. We've tried very hard to eliminate waste and reduce the amount of printed materials for the summit. No motor vehicle trips were generated. All of the events are accessible by walking, cycling, and transit. And our goal is to provide the experience of living in an eco-city by hosting a car-free conference. We appreciate your feedback. Um, please do share with us how you, uh, how you found this experience. And I hope that you enjoy the healthy living that Vancouver has to offer. And finally, Vancouver Convention Center also offers organic, locally produced, um, and in-season food. It's one of the few venues in the world, if not the only one, that has total control over its menu choices. And we have made a choice to provide you with box lunches, which I realize does generate additional um, paper waste. But we did look carefully at our options and thought this might be the most appropriate solution because there's a lot of opportunity for you to take your lunch and go outside, enjoy the sunny weather, which we're going to have for the rest of the week, go to the exhibitor hall, meet some um, of our exhibitors, see the posters. Um, so we wanted you to be able to be mobile. Finally, I want to give you a sense of what this week holds for you. The summit program focuses on what it means to be an eco-city. It looks at what eco-cities are doing around the world, what Vancouver is doing, and how we can each play a role in accelerating that transition to becoming socially just and ecologically sustainable cities. Woven through this overarching theme are three sub-themes that deal with climate action, circular economy, and informal solutions for sustainable development. The entire summit is being informed by the eco-city standards, and I encourage you to take a look at them if you're able. One of the things I think that's unique about EcoCities is we're not just talking about the incremental reduction of emissions, we're talking about absolute reductions. Circular economy is not an alternative form of growth, it's the alternative to growth. We know we need to reduce by at least 75 to 90 percent, a factor of 4 to 10, in our energy and materials throughput. So, I think what's interesting for me as someone who's been uh, very committed to the EcoCity movement since the 1990s is to see that this has gone from being a bleeding edge to a leading edge group of people who have solutions to offer, and that is you in the room. Thank you for spending time with us because it's through sharing and learning together that we, uh, we grow and learn. This is a movement that we're building. It's not a place where people just drop in, present, and leave. It is a thing that we do together, and together we grow stronger. And as Paul Hawkins said yesterday, if we're talking to the choir and the choir is getting bigger, that's okay. So with that, I'd like to welcome Kirsten Miller to the stage, Executive Director of EcoCity Builders, to say a few words. And Kirsten will be our moderator for today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 13th edition of the International EcoCity Conference Series, also known as EcoCity World Summit. 
And on behalf of the board of directors of our California-based nonprofit, EcoCity Builders, the stewards of the EcoCity World Summit Series, I'd like to sincerely thank BCIT, the city of Vancouver, and the Squamish Nation for welcoming this global convening to these unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples. EcoCity World Summit is the longest running conference series on sustainable cities. It was first convened almost 30 years ago now, in 1990 in Berkeley, California, by Richard Register, the pioneer of the EcoCity movement. But it didn't start out to be a series, and it might not have turned into one, if it weren't for the efforts and inspiration of Paul Downton and Cherie Hoyle, who, with Urban Ecology Australia, convened, convened the second conference in Australia, in Adelaide. Cherie couldn't be here today, but Richard Register and Paul Downton are here with us, and I'd like to ask them to stand and be recognized, please. We really wouldn't have this series if they hadn't launched it, so I'm really grateful. For me, uh, this conference series has been life-changing. Growing up in the Rocky Mountains of Montana, I had a generally unfavorable opinion of cities until I moved to Berkeley, met Richard Register, and experienced my first EcoCity conference in 2000, which was hosted by Curitiba, Brazil. Now, Curitiba is not a true eco city, and no place really is at the moment, but the experience of being there, wandering around car free streets and beautiful parks, convinced me that cities actually could be like the wonderful drawings in Richard's books. And in fact, cities in balance with nature and culture are not only necessary, but they're delightful and fun places to live in and visit. That was the fourth conference, and since then the series has been hosted in Shenzhen, China, Bangalore, India, San Francisco, Istanbul, uh, Montreal, Nantes, France, Abu Dhabi, and Melbourne, Australia. And now here we are in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, where the EcoCity movement has been locally and regionally active for years. You can see the results all around you. This keynote session, Sustainable Cities and Lifestyles, explores the extent to which cities enable citizens to live within ecological limits. Getting serious about sustainability requires understanding the systemic, social, and economic drivers of our unsustainable situation and what is needed to close the sustainability gap. So this session will feature two presentations on this topic, followed by a panel and discussion period with you, the audience. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jenny Moore. Uh, I'll say a few words about Jenny and then so hold your applause, but give a big applause when, when it's time. <laughs> So each EcoCity conference has a champion, a local leader who is the rainmaker for the entire convening, and the undisputed champion and rainmaker of EcoCity 2019 is Dr. Jenny Moore. I'm constantly impressed with her brilliance and drive, and I'm also so happy to call her a very dear friend. Dr. Jenny Moore is a visionary sustainability leader uh, prior to joining BCIT. She was Metro Vancouver's first air quality planner in charge of climate action, first demand side management planner, and an inspiration for the Sustainable Region Initiative. As founding coordinator of Vancouver's EcoCity Network, she helped bridge civil society and local government leadership on urban ecology. Her work helped initiate municipal greenhouse gas reporting, advancement of green buildings, community energy planning, and eco-industrial networking that has positioned the Vancouver region as a sustainability leader. Her research supports the Vancouver Greenest City 2020 Action Plan, Lighter Footprint Goal. She's authored several peer-reviewed articles and regularly contributes to EcoCity Insights, 
the EcoCity Builders newsletter. Her work has received numerous awards, including an Environmental Citizenship Award from the Canadian Federal Minister of Environment. So now I'd like to welcome Jenny Moore to the stage. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, me again. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about what an eco-city is and how eco-cities can support sustainable lifestyles. First of all, it's no surprise, I'm sure, to most of you in the room that uh, we live in the age of the Anthropocene, a time in which humans appropriate directly 50% of total global net primary production. That's a big word. What does it mean? It means the ecological production on which all of life depends. It is the, um, the basis of everything, and I'll go through explaining that. And at the same time, the Anthropocene means that humans are the dominant force that's moving energy materials, the relationship, the ecological relationships on Earth. So here we are in this Anthropocene, and I should also add that 80% or more of net primary production goes indirectly into supporting the human endeavor by supporting our domestic animals and whatnot. So we're literally consuming the Earth. Our urban impact is important. Cities are very effective ways for us to live with less impact. It's not that cities are bad, cities are very good. But our challenge is that our economic assumptions, our thirst for um, consumer goods, the lifestyles that we lead that epitomize high and gross levels of consumption that cannot be supported are a real challenge. So we're not culturally well adapted to living on Earth. And our built environment reflects that cultural belief system. As Richard Register often says, as we believe, so shall we build, and as we build, so shall we live. And so this is the fundamental challenge for us with EcoCities. So from an ecological perspective, and I would say from any perspective, because it's fundamentally true, natural capital is the only source of true production on Earth. Photosynthetic reactions, chlorophyll with sunlight, is the chemical basis upon which all life depends. It's responsible for the photosynthesis and pollination required to produce our food, our fuel, our fiber, even the fossil fuels, which originally started with animal bodies that compressed over time that depended on those um, fuels, right? Or sorry, that food. It's responsible for evapotranspiration and the things that we need to produce rainwater to drink, fresh water that we collect. Understanding how these urban ecosystems work and how net bioproductivity supports us is essential to the eco-city model. We don't just live in the city. We live in the global hinterland that surrounds all cities, and Vancouver lives in an area about 200 times the area of the city itself, and that's not unique. At the rural level, even in um, agricultural farming areas, most of us are leading urban lifestyles. If we're earning tertiary income and dependent on things like computers and um, flying and driving, then we're still having an urban lifestyle and we still have that dependency as well. Probably that exceeds what we're, only subsistence people would be living within their own territory. So for us, oops, no, that's not right. Um, for us, and then we can look at this uh, net primary production and about 12 billion hectares of the earth, total about 54 billion total hectares, is ecologically productive, capable of sustaining life as we know it, as what we want. And we have 7.8 billion people now. And that comes out to about 1.5 global hectares per capita if that was going to be distributed equally across all of us, which of course is not the case. And when we look at what it means for our conferencing to be socially just and ecologically sustainable, living within that ecological limit is what's needed. The social justice piece is the critical element. I really believe if we only got the social justice piece right, we would figure out how to distribute the resources that are available in a way that enabled all of us to live decent lives. And so for social justice, you know, the, the basis really is healthy culture, well-being, and quality of life. And it's about access, access to education, information, work, housing, healthcare, and services. 
So we can measure those things through reported well-being, longevity, literacy, and in the income gap, right? Who's got more, who's got less? When we add ecologically sustainable to that, we then look at how are we living healthy uh, uh, quality lives within Earth's caring capacity? And there we need to look at the health of the biodiversity that supports us and the ecological integrity of the whole system of Gaia that enables homeostasis on this planet to persist so that we can um, continue. So here we're looking at impact, energy, materials, food, water, and we can measure those things through our ecological footprint, our carbon footprint, which is just one piece of the ecological footprint that adds in the land and biodiversity. So here we have it, socially just and ecological sustainable cities, talking about access and impact. And the EcoCity model then tries to achieve both of those objectives. I'm stealing a slide from Richard Register here, which looks at how a city can over time evolve by finding the centers and concentrating development in those centers and then depopulating in the suburban areas that have a high infrastructure overburden that we already know we can't support. So we can enable access by proximity through land use design that affords inclusive housing for everyone through mixed use developments, equitable distribution of amenities, and because it's compressed, you already have that mixing and that access built right in. Now, access by proximity is uh, available to us if we can, and you'll see it in downtown Vancouver. I think we do a really good job here mixing jobs and work side by side with green buildings, designing for the human body, mobility for the individual, not for the car. Uh, nature at the doorstep, it's one of our hallmarks, and it's a hallmark of EcoCity building, and creating fun and inclusive spaces, a city that works for everyone. The slide that uh, isn't in this deck, and I'm sorry I moved it, was in order for us to be able to uh, create those spaces, we also have to think three-dimensionally, building up and down. So using appropriate subterranean uses, uh, things that don't need daylight, like movie theaters, uh, shopping malls, anyone who went on field trip one would have walked through the, um, uh, the shopping mall that goes underground here, Pacific Center, and leave the surface areas for growing food, for um, people to enjoy rooftop cafes and vistas, um, that's what we need to be thinking more and more about. And we're starting to see that here in the downtown of Vancouver. So it's also about inclusive, tolerant, and safe, accountable places. Good governance is the essential piece here. And we, we, it's often the elephant in the room, right? If we have accountability in our governance, then a lot of these things follow. So thinking about the dimensions of sustainability, everything starts from ecosystems out of which society evolves. So there's that fundamental relationship of dependence that we can't escape. And within society, then we agree what has value and how to exchange, and we do that through our economy. And unfortunately for us, the challenge is that we've kind of missed a few things. We decided to discount the future. We have not fully accounted for the true costs of uh, the goods and services that we exchange. We take nature services for free. And so now we're running into the reality, as um, Paul Hawken talked about, the feedback systems. But these, uh, these social dimensions create influence, which helps us determine where we live, where, um, what kind of work we want to seek, what we choose to value. So this dependence and influence relationship is the critical piece. In the EcoCity standards, it's informed out of this holistic systems perspective. We start with ecological imperatives, everything we need to live, healthy biodiversity, Earth's caring capacity, and ecological integrity, out of which then we look at what are the sociocultural features for us to um, be healthy in our culture. I would argue right now we don't have a healthy culture. In fact, we have a very uh, unhealthy, not well-adapted culture for survival on Earth. Um, it looks at community capacity and governance, lifelong education, well-being and quality of life. And then we look at what are the environmental, not ecological, the environmental essential elements for us to be healthy. Clean air, stable atmosphere, healthy soil, clean and safe water, not just for people, but for the animals, fish that live in the streams. Uh, responsible use of materials, clean and renewable energy, healthy and accessible food, and then finally out of that, how do we build? Access by proximity, safe and affordable housing, green buildings, environmentally friendly transportation. This is a heuristic to help us. It's, uh, it's meant to be diagnostic, it's constantly evolving, and you'll attend many sessions to this over the summit, including the Youth Caucus, that are looking at um, testing these standards, providing feedback. It's an open tool that just provides resources to help communities map their way, and we're benchmarking um, to look at who, what's working well, what kind of policies, what a, how do we know if we're actually 
ecologically sustainable and socially just. So I encourage you to check out the website, ecocitystandards.org, and please be involved in our conversations. We always use the Eco City World Summits to engage people in that. So a challenge that I want to pose to us is when we think about sustainable cities, we often do a conventional analysis looking at cities like Zurich, London, Hong Kong, Singapore, Seoul, Korea, and Vancouver. These cities are leaders. They are doing amazing things to reduce their footprint, but none of them meet our sustainability criteria, as I've just outlined it. I would argue that we would also do well to look at cities like Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic, Havana in Cuba, Bogota in Colombia, Algiers in Algeria, Quito in Ecuador, and San Jose in Costa Rica. Not necessarily your usual poster childs for sustainable cities, except maybe Bogota, but these are cities that are doing much, much better. In fact, most of the Central and Latin American cities are doing very well in terms of achieving human development index, uh, high performance in literacy, longevity. They're doing it at one third the ecological footprint that we do it in North America, and Europeans do it at half. So we tend to look at the efficient and unsustainable cities as a benchmark. We tend to overlook the truly sustainable, albeit low income cities, but I think that's where we need to start paying attention. So when we look at our comparison of our footprints, we look at places like North America and Europe, and we see that Europeans typically are leading equally uh, satisfying lives at half the footprint that we do here. And then we look at um, Latin America, and they do it at one-third the footprint. And the world average, unfortunately, is already in exceedance of global ecological carrying capacity. Remember that 1.5 global hectares per capita? The world typically sits at closer to 2.7. And then there's places um, like um, Caribbean countries, um, India, they're much lower. Uh, the lowest you can get, by the way, is about 0.5 global hectares per capita, and that's really just subsistence. It's what you need just to eat. So the global sustainability gap that we need to close is about 37% world average. And um, we can look at what does that mean for us. We can start to break down the numbers because a lot of people aren't used to thinking in terms of global hectares. Uh, that's an average biologically productive land area if it was distributed across all different land types. But what we are familiar with is calories. How many calories do we actually need to eat? So we see in a fair earth share what the average calories are, average world consumption, and then we see at three planets or more, right? So what that fair share is 1.5 degrees or 1.5 global hectares, Freudian slip. World average is above what's actually sustainable right now. Three planet and more is like a North American lifestyle. And so you can see from calorie intake in North America, we, we struggle with obesity. We're eating way too much. Um, meat consumption, you can see how it goes up per capita per person. Larger households in smaller living areas in the one planet scenario versus what we actually do here. We look at household energy. The larger the home, typically, the more energy you need. And maybe you can make it renewable, but even a photovoltaic cell has about 12 years of embodied energy in its production before it actually becomes a net energy producer. So there's really no free ride. This is just basic uh, thermodynamic laws that we deal with. Motor vehicle ownership. Almost nobody has a car in these one planet cities versus one car for every two people in North America. And as you can see, the carbon dioxide emissions that go with that. Life expectancy is higher in uh, the North American context, but I said there are some anomalies. These are global averages. There are places that achieve very, very high literacy, very, very high longevity at one third the ecological footprint we do. This is a horrible slide, but I only show it to convey to you that we can break that number down into qualitative descriptions that actually tell us what it looks like to live at one planet. And uh, I won't read it all out, but it deals with uh, dietary choices, the percentage of um, plant and animal-based um, foods that we're eating. It deals with um, the population that is living within close proximity, five kilometers of uh, walking to services. Those kinds of things help inform our standards. So we, we can actually map those lifestyle work and, uh, and look at it both from a qualitative and quantitative perspective. Now, in terms of sustainable consumption practices, why do we focus on consumption? I would argue it's because it helps us tell the truth about what our impacts are. 
It enables people to make better choices because that is something we can have control over. And it helps us link the choices that we make to the metrics that we're using and the outcomes around our ecological footprint, our carbon footprint, our total energy material flows, whether or not those are being shared equitably. It helps sensitize us and helps us think about leveraging our city through engagement in the policies that are driving us into unsustainable or sustainable lifestyles. So the work that I've been doing for many years now is supporting the City of Vancouver's Greener City 2020 Action Plan Lighter Footprint Goal. And when we started this work, uh, you know, it was, a, it was an interesting journey. And um, the city was surprised to see that for Vancouver, which is better than Canada as a whole, it was a 60% sustainability gap that we needed to close. So a much bigger gap, and we were able to model what One Planet Living could look like for Vancouver, mapped against the international average. Notice the international average. These are based on real numbers, not hypothetical. They're already lower than what Vancouver One Planet would need to be. And that's just based on about 13 countries that are already achieving One Planet living. And I think it's always surprising to people when I say most people actually live at One Planet. Right? This, is, this is only the 20% of the very, very wealthy, us, many of us in this room, um, and others uh, like us, uh, that are consuming the Earth. Most of the global population is living at one planet. So it, we can know how to do it. And where we're uh, losing, or I don't want to use this, I'm, I'm Paul Hawkins sensitized now to losing the war, building the battle. Uh, but where it's embedded is in energy and in, in land associated with producing food. And so we can take this data and we can show what that looks like in terms of pie charts, bar graphs, helping us understand the data. I wanted to put it in this pie chart because I want to show you how it compares directly to um, the activity. So this is the same data shown now only for carbon. This is our carbon footprint based on Vancouver's consumption. And you can see here that transportation is very significant. And historically, we only used to look at transportation buildings and waste because that's what our community emission inventories asked us to do. But if we look at our consumption and add that in, it doubles the entire greenhouse gas emission inventory and food starts to show up and waste gets much bigger because now we're dealing with consumables. If we look at the ecological footprint, same, same consumption patterns, but the data changes again because now we're bringing in the land associated with producing food. And food is very significant because there's energy in food fertilizers, pesticides. The kind of industrial agriculture that we're producing is literally giving us the opportunity to eat fossil fuels. So we can look at this for different cities. I've had the opportunity to work with EcoCity Builders and map different cities and also with Bioregional. And you can see here, I'm just giving you some sense of how it changes in Medellin. It's uh, an interesting city because it's held up as an example of sustainability, but Medellin has a dubious distinction of having an ecological footprint higher than the national average. Um, but here you can see the transportation and food, even in the consumption-based emission inventory, and then it switches to food and buildings. In Durban, similar transportation and food. So it's, it's sensitizing us to some things that we weren't aware of before. When I showed you Vancouver's footprint previously, food was half of the footprint. That was when we did it in 2006. And we've had the uh, ability to do longitudinal studies with Vancouver. And this is their latest footprint from 2017. And uh, here we see that the food footprint is going down. It's not necessarily um, that uh, Vancouver's done anything except we have introduced in Metro Vancouver the um, banning of food scraps. But we've also now started to get comfortable as a society talking about food waste and dietary choices. I remember when we first presented this data, we're like, oh, we can't talk about food, no, no. Um, but I also have been in this game long enough to remember that 30 years ago when we started talking about transportation, it was the same thing. We can't tell people how they commute to work. That's taboo. Now we're very, very comfortable saying walk, cycle, transit, get out of your car. And so we're increasingly getting more comfortable to socialize the things that, the conversations that we need to be having about eating uh, plant-based diets eating in season, not wasting, only taking as much as you really need and being very conscientious about that. So I want to just go through now some of the hot spots around consumption for, I'll use Vancouver as a case study. 
it changes a little bit from place to place depending on what um, the cultural values of the uh, economy are. In India, for example, there's not a lot of meat consumption. It's not a big issue. Um, but for Vancouver, our meat uh, consumption is significant. It's half of the footprint, and so it's a quarter of the total footprint. And red meat it makes up about 60% of that. If we were looking just at carbon, we'd be looking also at dairy as very significant. You can see it's still significant in the footprint, with, which is the land as well. For buildings, it's energy. It's the operating energy in our buildings, both on the commercial and the institutional. And so where I talked about what the city can do on food, we're talking about food, we're supporting community gardens. It's not going to be green roofs and living walls. It's not going to be enough. We absolutely require on that hinterland to provide our food. But at least being able to sensitize us to the fact that this is an underdependency is a start. For buildings, things that cities can be doing and are doing is regulating energy performance. And BC is a real leader with the step code. I think it's great. We're stepping up to getting to net zero uh, energy in buildings. But it's also about the emissions, the bodied emissions in the buildings and thinking about um, the materials there. So here we see that it's about 12% against the energy profile. Um, as we start to bring that down, it'll be more. And I would like to argue um, one important thing that cities can do here. We think about um, words like economic growth as synonymous with good, when in fact growth is just getting bitter, bigger. And we think about real estate development uh, as building bigger when in fact development should be about building well. So I would argue that the city needs to be thinking about issuing permits that prove that development is helping to improve things. And when we're issuing business permits, is this business really doing something positive? And I just want to make a little plug for a campaign that I've tried to get going for many years called Close the Door on Climate Change. If you walk down Robson Street and you see businesses that have their doors open in the middle of the winter because they're trying to entice you in, please go in and ask them to close them. That's a sign that they really don't care about the future of the planet. And I would say we shouldn't be shopping in those businesses. So there's things that the city can also be doing to get more involved in these kinds of activities and shaping our culture to be responsible. If we're in a climate emergency, there's zero tolerance for that kind of thing. On consumables and waste, we've always focused on waste, but in fact, the supply chain is where everything is at. It's where the 90% of everything, uh, materials and energy that goes into what you touch, the clothes you're wearing, the microphone that I'm using, is only 7% of the footprint. The rest is the embodied energy and materials inside of it. And the biggest perpetrators here are paper, plastics, textiles, so things like slow fashion, things like um, really trying to go paperless in our transactions. You know, every time you get that receipt, if you don't need it, really don't take it. Um, try and go paperless with uh, all your invoices and bills. And then transportation, of course, it's again mostly in the energy and what we can do here. Electric vehicles, it's a transition, but look at the embodied energy in the vehicle fleet. We can't get to one planet living with vehicles because it drives the unsustainable infrastructure that's very spread out. We have to be, able to, to be able to get to most of everything we need by 86% of our trips away walking, cycling, and transit. We just simply can't sustain this kind of sprawly infrastructure. So I would say banning minimum parking requirements, number one thing. Build for the human body. Every time you have a requirement for a parking space, you're building for the car. And that's not what we need, and it's not what's going to sustain us. It's unsustainability. And then look at air travel as well. So in Vancouver, this is a map of the metropolitan region, we have evolved over a long time with this polycentric model that reflects what Paul Downton calls ecopolis, where we have compact mixed-use centers connected by rapid transit. If you're in those centers, you can achieve that walk split of, uh, or the walking, cycling, and transportation mode split of 86%. And our um, agricultural land is important. We're trying to protect it. We're not always doing a good job. The city can enable us to affect about 40% of our ecological footprint through things like land use and density, building height and massing, transportation infrastructure, utility services, providing open space and natural features. But 60% of our choices are our own, our diet, our dwelling size, where we choose to live, whether or not we can afford a bigger space might not be the issue anymore. Vehicle ownership air travel and consumable purchases are a big piece. And where we achieve sustainability is when these things come together. When the city enables the citizens and the citizens hold the city accountable to produce sustainable cities that enable us to live sustainable lives.
So very quickly, top actions that we can take for One Planet Living, making most of our trips by walking, cycling, and transit, reducing food waste, um, reducing red meat consumption, improving energy efficiency, and um, reducing paper consumption. The City of Vancouver's Greenest City Action Plan was looking at um, a bunch of these issues around zero waste and ecosystem health and framing it all in a green economy because that's the underpinning system that's driving us into unsustainability right now and trying to look at that lighter footprint goal. This kind of research also inspired a response to the 1.5 degree climate stabilization target that we needed to achieve, which was uh, how do we live at 1.5 degree lifestyles? And so there is a plan to go from three tons to two tons to one ton by 2050, 2030, 2040, 2050. It's a huge jump. Remember I showed you 14 tons per capita for Canada on average. In Vancouver, we're at 10. So uh, we're not really sure how we're going to do this. Uh, we have some ideas, similarly to footprint research, it's the same issues around dairy and meat consumption, transportation, et cetera. And I think Rio Cody and Michael Lettenmeyer might be in the room, the authors of that report. If you're here, wave your hand. I, we, we have copies of this report available. Unfortunately, Louis Kinji, who is going to be on our panel today, is not able to join us, so I just wanted to give a plug that we are looking at these issues now. And finally, to think about our economic transition from the um, linear economy to one that's circular, and one that actually drives down total consumption. And that's a challenge, right? We have thermodynamics. The reality is it's not, a, it's not an infinite uh, wheel. It doesn't go around. There's always drag. There's always entropy. So we're always going to be net consumers. But things like industrial ecology and other things that you've heard of will help us get there. And the last theme for us, informal solutions for sustainable development. Many people are already solving for uh, how to harvest rainwater, how to produce their own energy on site, clean and appropriate technology, and business and civil society leadership. These are important things, and I'm so proud to be able to bring this to the summit as an important focus for us. So in summary, consumption hotspots, red meat, dairy, um, bottled beverages, buildings, energy use, paper, plastics, and textiles for consumables, vehicles in air travel. If we think about the systemic, social, and economic drivers of unsustainability, it's our addiction to economic growth and our failure to understand that it's now diseconomic. It's tweaking with technology as opposed to really rethinking who we are and what we're doing and what do we actually believe has value. It's selfishness versus sufficiency. We've become a culture that literally has legitimized unethical behavior by saying it's just business or I'm entitled. We have to rethink those things. One Planet Lifestyles, repurposing and fixing our belongings, sharing things, avoiding consumption, making all of our um, surfaces plantable, trips at uh, high walking, cycling, transit, building energy efficiency, getting to net zero. And what can cities do? My last slide, I know I'm over time. Policy alignment. In some places, including Vancouver, it's actually illegal to do some things that we want to do around sustainability. So going through the entire policy format and making sure that our bylaws align with what we want is important. Tax investment. We take taxes right now, we invest them in things that are unsustainable. And yet we also invest in trying to undo the very things that we're simultaneously investing in that are unsustainable. So getting on the same page with our alignment and how we use public taxes to build sustainable cities is important. Development and business permits. If it's not helping us achieve our goals, maybe they don't deserve a permit. So how do we really think through this and challenge ourselves? If we're in an emergency, these are the hard questions we need to tackle. Density rate transfers so that we can depopulate the suburbs and concentrate development in our centers. Designing for the human body, not the car body. This has got to stop. We cannot, uh, you know, that definition of insanity, you cannot solve the problems with the same thinking that got you into this. And finally, really being fearless around best available technology. If all we do is follow the dollar and the dollar doesn't actually cons consider the true value, we are part of the unsustainability solution. So I hope that's a, a sufficient start to, uh, to our presentation for the morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I think that was um, a really good foundational presentation. Um, I really am uh, so excited to see someone who's taken all of the principles of EcoCity and uh, worked to look at the data and see really how both cities and citizens living in these cities 
can move the dial towards eco-cities. It, it's very clear and actionable, so it's, um, it's great work. Um, I'm going to move on now to introduce um, another one of my eco-city heroes, and that's Dr. William Reese. His insights into what sustainability actually requires has underpinned much of the foundation of the EcoCity framework and standards. And I'm really grateful for his very astute insights, which the rest of us EcoCity practitioners consistently rely upon. Dr. Reese is a population ecologist, ecological economist, and former director and professor emeritus of the University of British Columbia School of Community and Regional Planning. His research focuses on the biophysical requirements for sustainability and the implications of global ecological trends. He has developed a special interest in modern cities as dissipative structures, and I'm sure we'll hear more about what exactly that is, and particularly vulnerable components of the total human ecosystem and in socio-cognitive barriers to sound environmental policies. He's best known as the originator of the ecological footprint analysis, and he's authored over 160 peer-reviewed papers and numerous, numerous popular articles on unsustainability. Reese's academic work has been widely recognized. He was elected Fellow of Royal Society of Canada in 2006, and has since received a Trudeau Foundation Fellowship, an honorary doctorate from Laval, the International Boulding Prize, and Herman Daly Awards in Ecological Economics, and a Blue Planet Prize jointly with Dr. Mati Spockernagel. So I'd like to warmly welcome uh, Dr. Reese to the stage. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you all for being here. It's uh, wonderful to see you, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Vancouver. And I'm just going to say thank you overall to everyone who has been responsible for putting this together so I don't have to take too much more time. Uh, Jenny's given us a very interesting and, and, I think, insightful overview of what happens to happen at the local level. And I thought I'd take a step back and try to contextualize the whole week's proceedings in a more global framework. And I'd like to start by kind of outlining or assessing what the mainstream take on urbanization is. We understand that we're going to see an increase to about 6.7 billion people living in cities. That's a 68% of humanity by 2050. There will be 43 megacities. These are cities of over 10 million people. Now, that's a standard view of the urbanization trend, but I want to emphasize that it takes into account absolutely nothing other than demographics. So there's no contextual framing for this kind of analysis. There's no environment, there's no energy considerations, or any of the other things that might influence these kinds of happy projections. If we look at another standard uh, analysis, we see over and over again, Cities, no problem. They only occupy 3% of the world's surface. In fact, the built-up land is, is less than 0.65% uh, of the world's surface. So some economists would say anybody who's flown in an airplane can see the world is empty. Growth is not a problem. Certainly population growth is not a problem. The world is empty. But the de facto land, and I, Jenny's made this point already, is the land that we occupy ecologically. If you're a typical North American, your lifestyle requires six or seven average hectares of average global productivity to sustain your levels of consumption and waste production. That is now urban land. So that we have to understand that the spot on the map, the political area of the city, the built-up area of the city is a fraction of 1%, typically, of the actual land appropriated for use by the people who live in that city. So the ecological footprint of typical cities are hundreds to even a thousand times larger than the urbanized political areas. And in fact, when you uh, 
extrapolate to the world as a whole, recognizing that we are in a state of overshoot, cities today, far from occupying less than 0.65 or 3% of the land, use 125% of the world's productive land area. If we look at Tokyo, for example, I, I chose this simply because it's the largest city on the planet. It has an ecological footprint 365, <clears throat> pardon me, 365 times larger than its metro region and four and a half times larger than the area of Japan. Now, that means that Japan, let alone Tokyo, is entirely dependent for its survival on trade flows, on the integrity of the fossil fuel uh, sustained globalization program that has enabled cities of this size to arise simply because those global uh, lines of communication, of, of transportation, enable cities to appropriate the productivity of land areas vastly further away uh, from them. If we look at this in the global context, the overall picture is that the world as a whole is as much as 68% in overshoot. There's 20 billion active hectares on the pardon me, uh, planet being used by human beings, but there's only 12.2 billion hectares of ecologic productive land and waterscape. Well, you ask, how can we be using more than there is? And the reason is simple. It's at the bottom of this slide. We are literally consuming the ecological basis of our own existence. We are living and growing by converting the standing stocks of natural capital into human bodies and infrastructure like this. We have become, because of this overshoot, kind of like a maggot in an apple. We are more or less parasitic on the body of the planet. Now, this is a graph that every school child should learn in kindergarten and subsequently in every year thereafter. We could extend the axis to the left by 200,000 years and it would be absolutely flat. This is population growth. For 99.95% of human history, there was no relevant, useful way of looking at human population growth. It's only been the last couple of hundred years that we've seen any of in, anything resembling the kind of growth curve that we're familiar with. Continuous population and economic growth is an anomaly, okay? Only seven or eight generations of 20,000 generations of human beings have experienced growth in sufficient quantity to even notice it in their lifetimes. And it's almost entirely the result of fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is the means by which we acquire all the other resources needed to raise the human enterprise ever further from the thermodynamic equilibrium that Jenny talked about. Understand what I'm saying here. We depend on fossil fuel as the primary resource to get everything else, including all of our food as we grow it at present. Look at the pace of change. This is something most of us are unconscious of because we're like fish in a fishbowl. We don't notice the water. It took two, if you think of anatomically modern human beings, it took 200,000 years for us to grow from virtually nothing to one billion people. It took just 200 years, one one thousandth as much time to balloon to an additional seven and a half fold to six or 7.6 billion in 2018. I guess it's even greater than that this year by another <clears throat> tenth of a billion. Meanwhile, real gross product in that same 200 year period has increased a hundredfold. Per capita incomes, that's to say consumption has increased by a factor of 13, 25 in rich countries, and fossil fuel consumption is up 1,300 fold in just 200 years. That, again, is the driver of all of these other forms of growth on a finite planet which hasn't grown any larger. These graphs, I, I thank my friend David Hughes, who's a top energy analyst in Canada, for putting these together. He just wanted us to recognize the correlation and, in fact, interdependence of population growth, per capita energy consumption, and gross consumption of energy. They're the same curve. We are made out of and utterly dependent still on fossil energy. Here's another trick. 
or associated, it's almost a mind trick, of exponential growth. This is the curve for coal, oil, and gas. You will notice that one half of all the fossil fuels ever consumed on planet Earth have been consumed since 1990, roughly 30 years ago. 90% of all the fossil fuels ever used on Earth have been consumed in my lifetime. I was born in 1943. So this exponentiation cannot continue on a finite planet already in overshoot. So here's the first question I want you to carry with you through the rest of this week. Do you really believe, along with national governments, business leaders, major international agencies, including the United Nations, most NGOs, that the human enterprise can maintain its present growth trajectory indefinitely, which means doubling GDP again by the early 2040s, and that urbanization can continue uninterrupted, as projected, on a finite planet that is already being undermined by overshoot. Now, I'm a population ecologist, and this is a very common curve when we study population ecology. I would be derelict in my duty if I didn't have to ask us this question. Is Homo sapiens approaching what we call the plague phase of a one-off population boom-bust cycle? You'll see the first half of this curve is virtually identical to the human population curve and all of these other curves we've been looking at. It cannot continue to escalate, to accelerate in the directions we're headed. Part two then engages cities and energy and climate change because that's really where all of this is coming from. And I have to emphasize again that modern cities would not be possible in the absence of abundant cheap energy. And for that reason, climate change poses an unprecedented challenge to the mere existence, to the very existence of our cities. If we look at global energy right now, again, thanks to Dave Hughes, this is the graph of, of what it looks like. You'll notice that 86% or thereabouts of global primary energy consumption is still fossil fuels. Renewables, apart from hydro, constitute just over 4%. And if you look at the breakdown on the right-hand side, a good deal of that is biofuels and biomass. Solar and wind are still trivial contributors, despite what we might hear, uh, to the total global energy budget. These are the energy sources doing the world's work at the present time. In 2018, I got these data right off the most recent uh, output from the BP Statistical Review of Energy. Oil, gas, and natural gas provided the globe with its energy for 309 of the 365 days. Dams and nuclear power would have powered us for just 41 days. Wind, solar panels, turbines, biomass, all of the uh, non-renewables, or rather renewables, for a mere 15 days, okay? Meanwhile, again, I want to really emphasize this. We are utterly dependent for 309 days out of the year on fossil fuels, and we are being asked to hold the temperature rise to well below 2 degrees and make efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. This translates into reducing our carbon emissions to about 50% of 2010 levels, which are actually uh, lower than today, by 2030, which means 7% per year reductions beginning now. Do you really think there will be 20 or 7% less energy being consumed in this country one year from now? We have to completely decarbonize by 2050 if we are going to avoid those potentially catastrophic levels. But again, this is what we are being told. This is our social construction of an illusion. Solar and photovoltaic wind power are rapidly uh, getting cheaper and more abundant, so much so that they are on track to entirely supplant fossil fuels worldwide within two decades. An area of the Earth only 335 kilometers square will provide more energy than the world needs. And that's only, what, 1.2% of the area of the Sahara. By the way, if you ever went forward with that plan, one dust storm would destroy the entire world's energy supply. Well, 
You can believe, if you like, that green energy is taking over, but it's not. Another very well-known friend or energy analyst and friend of mine, Tad Patsek, provided this little slide. People's hope increases with their ignorance of energy and its depend or our society's dependence thereon. And just to underscore this, most people don't believe this, and don't blame me, these are just the data, these are real data. The yellow line represents the annual global total production of all the solar photovoltaic installations in place on Earth. The blue line is the annual increase at the margin in demands for electricity. In other words, in almost every year except the market crash in 2009, the increase in demand for electricity globally exceeds the entire output of all solar installations after 30 years of development of solar power. If we throw wind into the mix, wind and solar together will be completely wiped out by just two years of growth in the demand for electricity. And keep in mind that electricity is only 20% of the total energy picture. The other 80% isn't even represented here, and it's all fossil fuel. So here is what solar energy output looks like compared to the rising demand. The yellow line you can barely see at the bottom is our solar photovoltaic installations. The red line is the increasing demand for global electricity. And way up in the top, I just put the last couple of years, demand for uh, non-renewable primary energy. So even electricity dwarfs the solar production. And if you throw in the carbon-based fuels, it, it's almost irrelevant. Here's another or slide that people simply are unaware of. All of these curves are exponential growth curves. The top one is the world GDP, or consumption if you like. The green curve is energy use. We then have carbon dioxide emissions and efficiency increases. Every one of these is an exponential curve. They are rising lockstep in constant proportionality. Efficiency gains then have had no effect whatsoever on the rate of increase in consumption. Decoupling is not happening at any scale. So the question I'd like to pose at this point is, based on these data, do you believe, along with most political parties in Canada, the promoters of Green New Deals anywhere, techno-optimists of all stripes, that the world's nations can meet their already inadequate, the Paris demands are inadequate, the, the commitments that, that have been made, uh, uh, by making a rapid transition to green renewable energy? Think about that very carefully in light of what I've been saying. My response is, that's a vacant chair. I want to welcome a new member to the group, renewable energy without economic collapse. There's nobody there. So this is the climate energy conundrum that faces our major cities. We can choose, supposing we panicked and just stopped using fossil fuel, rapid decarbonization at at least 7% per year in the absence of a plan and in the absence of a substitute. This would result in far-reaching transformation of communities, economies, material lifestyles, and we would achieve living within the means of nature, which is Jenny's goal. However, we would risk inadequate energy supplies to supply cities, broken supply lines, food under the resource shortages, local famines, reduced production, declining incomes, rising inequality, widespread unemployment, civil unrest, abandoned cities, mass migrations, collapsed economies, and geopolitical chaos. Or we can stay the fossil fueled course, maintain allegiance to the growth paradigm and the il illusion of rescue by technology. We can grow the economy so the next generation has the wealth and technology to mitigate the consequences of climate change. And by the way, uh, last year's Nobel Prize in Economics was given pre for pre precisely that argument, okay? However, by doing so, we would risk more and longer heat waves, droughts, desertification, melting permafrost, methane releases, water shortages, failing agriculture, possible famines, rising sea levels, the flooding and eventual loss of many coastal cities, other uninhabitable cities because of heat, and therefore mass migrations, collapsed economies, and geopolitical chaos. That's the conundrum in which we find ourselves in the real world, just looking at the real data of real trends happening right now as we all sit here contemplating something different. My prediction is 
that we will follow option number two. We will rescue the economy by staying the present course. Humans are natural discourse, discounters. We prefer to push off to the future risks if we can gain by doing so. And we've already chosen that option many times. This is a plot of the steadily increasing, geometrically increasing again, or exponentially increasing uptick in carbon dioxide emission levels. We've seen a 45% increase in emissions since pre-industrial times. And you will notice each of the major international agreements on climate change along the course of this uptick. You cannot detect statistically any impact of any of those agreements on the upward directions of carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. We have had 50 years, 33 climate conferences, and a half a dozen major international agreements which have not reduced atmospheric carbon concentrations. We will save the economy despite the risks posed by rising greenhouse gas emissions. So, it gets worse because if you look carefully at the negotiations and what comes out of them, governments and the corporate sector see climate change as a profit center, as an investment opportunity. Go online, you'll see several websites talking about this $26 trillion of potential gains to be made by investing in new technologies to avoid climate change. Building capacity, build, uh, capacity building rather, that's different from building capacity. Wind and solar technology, smart city infrastructure, rapid transit, electric vehicles, as yet undeveloped carbon capture and story uh, storage technologies are the kinds of things that get the approval at these negotiations, where governments with their private sector advisors come together to decide what would be done. So anything that would require major investment and in so-called green jobs, or in other words, more economic growth and profit-making potential, is up for grabs. All of which infrastructure, by the way, would have to be produced with fossil energy and associated carbon emissions. None of the green technology is produced with green technology. If you think of one wind turbine, one, 817 tons of steel, 2,270 metric tons of concrete, 41 tons of non-recyclable plastics, and in Canada, the average plan that government is putting forward for multiple approaches to green energy would require 37,000 wind towers of this consumptive capacity. Okay? What's not seriously on the table, what we're not discussing as a culture, are structural changes to the economy that would dramatically lower consumption and significantly reduce energy and material throughput. We are not discussing policies for income and wealth redistribution as is necessary for equity. We are not talking about population reduction strategies. Arguably, climate disaster policy is designed to serve the capitalist growth economy. Clive Spash, a very excellent ecological economist, has argued, if that's the case, the latter, the capitalist growth economy, becomes the solution and not the cause of the problem. Unfortunately, many environmental NGOs have bought into this illogical reasoning, and that's because most of them are funded by the same corporate entities that they're allegedly fighting on the front lines. So this is what the International Energy Agency, what the US Energy Information Agency, both project our future looks like. Okay, remember I've said we will buy into the stay the course, and here's what stay the course looks like. This is their most recent last month's projections. Global energy demand will increase 44% by 2050, which is a greater absolute amount than the total contribution from renewables. In other words, carbon emissions will continue to rise, the world will blow past the two degree warming limit, and we risk spiraling into hothouse earth conditions if you look at the latest of the climate science. So what you environmentalists have got to understand is that the destruction of the planet is the price we are going to pay to maintain, in the short term, a healthy economy. On our current trajectory then, there will be no sunset in the oil patch anytime soon. 
The world will suffer accelerating, potentially catastrophic climate change, and global economic contraction is likely in the long run, and societal collapse is a real possibility. Whoops, wrong. Here's what a really smart city should be doing today. Let us acknowledge the reality of these. By the way, these are just real numbers. Anybody can confirm in a few, can confirm in a few hours of research. We need to talk about the reality of overshoot. Human beings and our domestic animals have gone from zero or less than 1%, well less than 1% of the biomass of mammals on Earth to over 96% today. Wild mammals have been pressed to the margins where they occupy only 4% of the total biomass of mammals on the planet. All those wonderful herds in Africa and, and so on less than 4% of total biomass. We are literally displacing the rest of nature and converting the material basis of the planet into our own selves. That cannot continue, it can, certainly can't double again. Therefore, we have to accept both the theoretical and practical difficulties of the green energy transition. Even if we made that transition successfully and continued growing the way we are now, the world is consumed. We should be pressuring, this is what cities should be doing, national, provincial, and state governments to restructure the economy to remain within the allowable carbon budget. We know what the allowable carbon budget is, the amount of carbon we can burn and still stay within the temperature requirements, while developing and improving sustainable energy alternatives. I'm not saying they're contributing nothing and that they can't contribute more, but we have to get out of the first before we can really get into the second. We need to allocate that remaining carbon budget through rationing and quotas to essential uses. Food production today uses or produces about 28 to 30 percent of our carbon emissions. Ergo, it uses about that much of our energy budget. That can't continue. But we need to maintain food production above all else. Home heating, essential transportation. No city can survive without fossil fuel transportation by air, by sea, or land. This city has two and a half or three days of food supplies. Everything else is now traveling in tens of thousands of trucks and trains into the city to keep us going beyond the end of the week. That's fossil fuel. So to talk about abandoning it is, is nonsense until you have a substitute, and even then, as I say, you've got to back off. We need to relocalize essential economic activity. To continue plowing up agricultural land, by the way, there's only 50 years of soil left on the planet at current rates of destruction by uh, commercial agriculture and erosion. We should be growing as much of our food within reasonable distance of our cities if the cities are going to survive at all. We have to facilitate the adoption of the sustainable lifestyles North Americans lived on half the energy per capita that we use today just 40 or 50 years ago. Why are we so afraid of biting the bullet here and doing what is necessary to save civilization in the long run? We have to focus on income wealth redistribution if we're going to have a sustainable society. And of course, anyone who pays attention to this realizes that for the last 40 years of neoliberal economic development around the planet, the wealth gap has been steadily increasing. Most people have remained in place while the rich get steadily richer. So we're, going, we're doing everything in precisely the opposite direction required to get us to where we want to go. We need to, and this is the big forbidden thing we're not allowed to talk about, negotiate a global population strategy to plan a descent, listen to me, to plan a descent to the two to three billion people who could actually live sustainably, reasonably comfortably within the biophysical means of nature. Now, how many of the sustainable cities on the planet today, or those aiming in that direction, are taking seriously these kinds of recommendations, which would actually help to achieve the goals they all speak of? And that's where I will leave you. And I think these are the kinds of things we need to be thinking of through the rest of this conference. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Bill. Very sobering um, presentation, uh, but very much appreciated. Um, I think the, the unraveling is already happening. I think we all know that and are experiencing it in different ways. In the U.S., the political uh, chaos is, is happening, and um, I just woke up with an email uh, saying that their planned power outages uh, for my neighborhood and others uh, because of wind uh, danger uh, that are, have been in California setting off massive wildfires that are burning cities down to the ground. So it's, um, it's here. So I appreciate your insights. So we're going to keep moving along and the next part of our session is a panel. And um, I'd like to just invite uh, Bill and Jenny and the panelists to the stage. And then I'm going to introduce each of the panelists and they're each going to give us uh, a few insights. And then we'll have a uh, dialogue with the audience before we close. Doug, you're also up. Okay. Great. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce Douglas Reagan, and he's uh, here on the end. Um, he's worked in youth development at the local, national, and international level for the past 30 years. And currently, he is the unit leader for youth and livelihoods uh, for UN Habitat managing UN Habitat's youth program, which has engaged over 500,000 youth through projects in over 70 developing countries. His current focus is working with youth in informal settlements and in conflict areas. He manages two flagship youth programs for UN Habitat, the Urban Youth Fund and the One Stop Youth Resource Centers. He's authored, co-authored, and edited 17 research and policy publications on urban youth issues, the most recent being the Global Youth-Led Development Series, representing some of the first research done on youth-led agencies in the developing world. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Diego Martino. Uh, he is, has a BA in International Affairs from the University of the Republic of Uruguay and an MA and PhD in Geography and Environmental Studies in Carleton University, Ottawa. During the PhD and postdoc at USC in Los Angeles, he researched on nature conservation in urban areas, and he's been coordinating lead author of State of the Environment reports at the global level, and he's coordinated several State of the Environment reports at the regional Latin America and the Caribbean national and city level. And in the past 20 years, He's been involved in environmental issues, working in NGOs, the United Nations, the National Government of Uruguay, and the private sector. And he's currently teaching at the School of Architecture of the ORT University in Uruguay. And finally, I'd like to introduce Colin Grant, Chief Commercial Officer for Fig Bites. And he's a veteran of the sustainability movement, a multi-award winning innovator and an entrepreneur, and a regular conference speaker worldwide. He developed sustainable solutions from working with microbes to remediate contaminated land to developing boardroom level visualizations of sustainability strategies. And he's had the privilege of working with a prime minister and other senior, senior federal government officials, multiple mayors and city managers, and many CEOs. From 2001 to eight, he was a member of the Vancouver Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Group and he sat on several similar sustainability boards and advisory groups. He's currently Chief Commercial Officer for Fig Bites, where he helps Fig Bites clients to escape from hell in Excel, death by PowerPoint, and a thousand electronic paper cuts of PDFs while empowering them to present their plans and performance in pictures, and he also likes alliteration. <laughs> So thank you uh, for welcoming the panel to the stage. Um, and I'd like to start um, by inviting Douglas Reagan 
to say a few words. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. It's, um, again, if you've seen my other talks here, it's probably the first time I've been presenting in about 15 years here. I'm, I'm a board and, board and bred Vancouverite, but I live in Nairobi, Kenya, working with UN Habitat. Um, I'm going to take you through a, a presentation which, which will be both the banal of United Nations uh, things we sign and then moving on to something which I think will be a bit more controversial and uh, hopefully will uh, spur some discussion. Um, I was asked to speak on the new urban agenda. So yes, there was a new urban agenda that was designed uh, in 20. Uh, 16 in Quito at Habitat 3. As if you've seen again previous presentations, Habitat 1 was held here in Vancouver in 1976. Um, and that was kind of the founding, uh, founding conference for my agency. And so the last one is, was in 2016 in Quito. And specifically, I just wanted to kind of um, align what the United Nations is doing with what's going on with the ecological uh, eco-city standards and what's going on here. I mean, so the, in 2015, we had the Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of them, so you can pick any one you want. There's lots of stuff going on there. In 2016, the Newer Agenda was launched and it was adopted by member states at, the ha at Habitat 3 in Quito. The New Urban Agenda and the sustainable specifically Sustainable Development Goal, or SDG 11, places urbanization at the forefront of development policy, recognizing sustainable urbanization's critical role for overall development and prosperity in both developed and developing countries. What's interesting about that part is it's for everybody. Whereas we have, if you remember, and I don't know if you've heard, the Millennium Development Goals, which ended a few years ago, were solely for the developing world. Now the Sustainable Development Goals are for the whole world. So this is an, uh, an, uh, an alignment, an expansion of what the UN is working on. And so that's why we're here in Vancouver, not just talking about what we're doing down south, but also talking about what we're doing here. Um, Next. There's linkages between the new urban agenda and, this, and, and uh, the eco-city standards. And specific, so the, in the areas of urban design, biogeophysical, uh, physical, socio-cultural, and ecological, those four areas. The sociocultural is one that I'm going to focus on more, and that's on healthy culture, community capacity, healthy and equi equitable economy, lifelong education, and quality of life. So those, we, as the UN, we define, uh, we look at the for all piece, making sure that everyone's brought along, that we're not just talking about the developed world, and specifically when we're talking about the climate change crisis that we're in and such, we have to make sure that we're bringing everybody along, that we can't, no one can be left behind is the, the phrase. I did so, we, we were also lucky to um, be able, or lucky to be able to go into downtown Vancouver, and I just wanted to show you one of the areas that we very much focus on, which is housing. This was at Oppenheimer Park. There was an amazing um, graffiti there called, saying, human rights are God-given, not man-made. And again, we, this, human rights are the bedrock of what we do, the bedrock of what the UN stands for. And Oppenheimer Park, which I know is a contentious issue for me, I've, I've known it for many decades, but for many others, I mean, it's amazing to see what's happening with City Council and Parks Board and the, the discussions, the very heavy discussions, but it also is a sign that there is social exclusion going on, and it's not just happening in the developing world, it's happening here at home, and that we need to address these issues. So, I'm going to do a quiz. Everyone looks like they're a bit tired. So can everyone stand up? Groans, everyone's like, oh, geez, what are you going to do? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some photos, and if you don't know who the photo is, sit down, okay? And this is specifically looking again at social inclusion. So first photo. Anyone going to sit down on this? I'm thinking no. So who is this? Greta Thunberg. Okay. So the leader of the climate movement, the, wo the woman who has basically taken on the world in an amazing way, bringing out millions and millions of people traveling across the ocean on a sailboat. And I would say, and this uh, just prescient to what's going on in my next uh, few slides, is also being taken heavy fire 
for who she is. And it's not just from the, the, you know, the right and the right-wing media, but also from the left in terms of, oh, she's from Sweden, this, uh, she doesn't count, so on and so on. Anyways, that's Greta. Next slide. Anyone gonna sit down? Well, let me help you because I think you might know this bit, bit better. Does anyone know who that is? Severin Suzuki. You can stand up again if you know who it is now. So Severin Suzuki <clears throat> did this 30 years ago. Severin and Greta are kind of one in the same thing. The only issue is, the only difference as Severin would define it is, is that the level of hope that she might have had back then is much less now. When you, if you see Greta's presentation to the UN General Assembly, it is one of anger. It is one of, you have betrayed me. It is lines drawn in the sand. Severance was a little, a little bit more contextualized at the time. Sit down. There you go. This is Autumn Peltier. She's a water carrier. Um, she's here. <clears throat> um, she's, it, it, she's Canadian. She's indigenous. She's one of those amazing young women. So how, where are we? How are we got? It's hard to see with these things. How many people are still standing? Wave your hand. Okay. Anyone for this? This is Leah Numuerga. She's 14. She's from Uganda, Kampala, Kampala, Uganda. She was actually invited to come here, but also couldn't get a visa. Um, and she has done some amazing work in basically galvanizing young people in, in Kampala. She was front page of the New York Times, been interviewed by PBS, BBC. Really amazing, amazing work and uh, a, a true leader. Last one. Is anyone standing? Other than... <laughs> other than Jenny. Um, this is Chi Bastida. She will be speaking at the, uh, on Friday. She'll be, she's not going to expend the GHGs to fly here. Um, she'll be speaking uh, remotely from a climate change action in New York. She is, uh, again, she's uh, Otomi Toltec. She's from Mexico, Mexico uh, in around Mexico City. Again, and an, a, a companion of Greta, she's been in all the high-level meetings with her, and she's also a, an amazing young woman. So, obviously, what's the commonality here? They're young women. And what, what I am, the request and the ask for you is, and I've, what I'm also giving you, is all their, um, whoops, we'll go backwards, is giving you, is all their, their Twitter, Twitter handles. What we need to remember around social inclusion is that we have to include and we have to take people seriously. First off, when you look at Greta, oftentimes she's just dismissed, oftentimes by the left. There was actually a, and I, um, I have it on my Facebook and I was going to put it up, but then it would probably be a really poor career move, is there's a very senior UN retired person who basically did a, a big article in the, in the, um, in one of the papers in, the, in Europe and said, and her quote was, unfortunately, Greta seems to have joined the political theater and seems to have become a Hollywood production herself. Or maybe the coming weeks will prove me wrong and things will return to the prior status of innocence and truthfulness. Greta Thunberg is not in, about innocence and truthfulness. She's about truthfulness. She's about telling the story and it's outrageous that we continue to, to level fire at this young woman and make not take into account that these young women, all of them here, and there's hundreds more, are the leaders in this movement. This is a young women-led movement. We have to take it on. And uh, this is Greta said, I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to the scientists. I want you to unite behind the science, and then I want you to take action. She's not saying, listen to me because I'm a really cool person and let's go do something. She's saying, look at IPCC. She's saying, really, really. I mean, I, she's standing out of the way. She's probably the most selfless speaker I've seen in decades, which is probably why she's so, doing so well. So again, the perspective of UN Habitat, the perspective of the United Nations is we all have to move forward. We have to recognize whomever is doing it and we cannot, we make sure we have to park our prejudices and follow behind who's leading. Greta is leading there's, and there's hundreds of others. And here's the controversial slide. Stop listening only to me. I'm a 53 year old white guy, upper middle class, university educated. Where have you, we got you? over the last hundred years by only listening to us. 
where have we? This, <laughs> we, ha we have to, we, I mean, and this is not, I mean, Paul Hawken, Bill Reese, I'm not, in any, I mean, there's a lot of outliers, <laughs> people who are doing amazing work, so there's, there's no attack there. But in the majority, we have to look at this. We have to look at that. You sit in a UN General Assembly and whatever, and it's all a bunch of guys, and they're just taking us down the same route. We can get into arguments of what the difference between a young woman and a guy is and so on, but do we really just have to take a look at the structural change, and it really starts there at the gender level. So stop listening to me, please. Please listen to the people that are standing up and taking 50, 10, 15, 20 million people into the streets. Those are the people that we should be listening to and taking some leadership. As well as, you know, I can advise, but I shouldn't I'll be there up front. I really shouldn't be on stage, honestly. The, and this is from Chi, who again, we speak on Friday. The climate crisis is a man-made crisis is gonna be to have feminist solutions because I asked her specifically when I interviewed her, what is the difference? And she said, listen, it's just, I mean, she's indigenous, so she talked about Mother Earth, how there's the empathy, you know, we can have children, we're just different and we see things differently and that's what we, what we need right now, we don't need the same. We no longer need to have the same perspectives. So, thank you. Thank you, Doug. We're going to move along uh, to our next speaker, Diego Martino. And um, we need to keep yeah. our comment short. Thanks. Which is forward? Green, I guess. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, well, I'm a 48-year-old white guy. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be in Canada for me uh, back here. My two sons were born here. Um, my contribution to that growing trend of, of urban population, unfortunately. Um, I want to speak about this uh, report here, uh, Global Environment Outlook, uh, and the Geo for Cities, which is a derivative product from this Global Environment Outlook. Uh, the Outlook is a report by the UN Environment um, Agency that is published every four or five years. And um, during the process of, um, of producing the GEO6, uh, it was decided it was uh, timely to produce uh, a product that would help understand what is this, the role of cities of urban areas uh, in tackling these environmental challenges that are described in the GEO6 report. So I'm just going to spend uh, two minutes on the uh, urban situation in general and just a few challenges and opportunities that come from, from the GEO6 report. Um, as William was saying, uh, more than half of the population today lives in, in urban areas. Uh, it's probably more than, than that 54%, it's probably closer to 60, 70%. It all depends on, on what kind of statistics you're using. And we are heading to uh, two thirds or more by 2050. There remain serious social and environmental challenges of urbanization. They're still unsolved, particularly, but not only in the global south. And what we are expecting is that precisely in the global south is where 90% of the growth of cities will take place, mainly in Asia and Africa. Uh, this is China, India, and Nigeria mainly. So here, uh, there's another big challenge, challenge that we're facing uh, from the city's perspective. There are regional differences, but uh, the trend is that global cities are de-densifying, so they are growing in size more than they are growing uh, in the number of people. So this de-densification process is taken in, in all regions uh, with some differences between uh, one and, and the other. And 60% of the built environment required for this 2050 urban population is yet to be constructed. This is a, a huge challenge, but also a huge opportunity. Uh, the thing here is that it's a short window, it's a small window of opportunity, there's not a lot of time to make these changes, but the, the changes, the, the investment and design choices that we make today will determine how these cities will function in the coming decades. So it's a huge opportunity together with an enormous challenge. And, and 
in which cities are urban citizens living? I think this is a, an important thing to consider because we usually talk about the, the mega cities, the 10 or a million or more, the global cities. But if we look at this graph, I don't know if there's a pointer here, but the, the gray area on the bottom is um, urban citizens living in cities smaller than half a million people. And a lot of those are less than 300,000 people. That's 1990, that's 2014, 49%. And if we look forward, it's going to be around 47%. These are cities that have almost half of the urban population, but that have enormous challenges in terms of human resources, in terms of financial resources. And, and these are the cities that are going to be receiving a strong influx of population and that are growing at the fastest rates in many cases. So these are the cities where this population is going that are continuing to grow and they have a very small window of opportunity to, to move forward. So uh, in how do we, what do we conclude from the urban section of the Geo6 report that we're going to continue working on the Geo for Cities report is that urban growth can, and that is a, a big can, represent an opportunity to increase citizens' well-being while decreasing their ecological footprint. I just want to quickly forward into, um, this has been, I guess, moved around when we transition from one uh, format to the other, but we have moved from a negative or real view of, of cities to a more neutral, to a challenging or hopeful. I couldn't find a good icon for challenging. Uh, and I want to uh, read this three quotes. Um, this is from Autumn. Great cities are planned and grow without any regard to the fact that they are parasites on the countryside which must somehow supply food, water, air, and degrade huge quantities of waste. Again, it's a real uh, description, but also uh, at the same time a, a negative view of cities. If we move forward to the 1990s from the National Science Foundation, urban or any other places are not containers of sustainable or stable processes, but are rather produced through processes that may or may not be sustainable. Cities are not per se unsustainable. And the final one is that we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to shift the expected urbanization onto a more environmentally sustainable and social path. I think that we need to be uh, perhaps a bit naive, but hopeful about what cities can, can help us uh, in into turning into a sustainable society. Thank you very much. slides moving forward. Okay, uh, I think we're under time pressure. I hope my slides will come up. Um, so, Kirsten, I can see you saying tick, tick, tick. <laughs> Going to go very quickly. I've had a very interesting week, which I think kind of parallels uh, 50 or 60 years of ecological awakening and uh, the sustainability movement. I'm going to try and get through my, my week, um, entertain you a little bit. Uh, and also talk to you about a world-leading, we believe, project that's happening in the state of Minnesota right now. So I'm going to talk quite quickly. I know we're under time pressure. Um, so my wife and I arrived in Vancouver, where we used to live, on Saturday afternoon to house it and cat sit for some friends. Uh, cut a long story short, quickly, the uh, indoor feline became an outdoor feline very quickly, and we declared a uh, feline uh, uh, emergency escape moment and we realized we were in an emergency. We ran around the garden trying to catch this cat. Uh, the cat didn't want to be caught and told me so by biting through the tendon in my right hand. Uh, and I very quickly uh, got the cat into the uh, house and then went out for dinner with friends. A friend of mine said, no emergency, nothing to worry about here. We can go fishing tomorrow and duct tape the rod to your hand. Everything will be fine. Uh, my hand started to swell up. Um, and having a background in microbiology, Bill, I realized that we might be in an exponential population growth situation inside the tendon of my hand. Uh, I arrived at the hospital, and let's say Dr. Bruntland, we might call him, um, gave me my 1992 uh, diagnosis, which is no problem preserving your hand for the future of uh, your life. Everything's okay. We'll give you a prescription for antibiotics for tomorrow, being Sunday. By the time we got to the, doc, the, um, uh, the pharmacy, uh, the exponential growth curve had gone pretty, pretty uh, nastily. So Sunday night, my hand looked like somebody had blown up a, a surgical glove. 
Uh, I went to see another doctor, uh, let's call him Dr. Reese, who said, you're in big trouble. Now, I could have said that's a bit gloomy and doomy, Dr. Doom. I could have nicknamed him and I could have ignored him, uh, but I paid attention. I spent most of this week in hospital. Um, right after this, I have to go back and they might have to cut it open and, and, um, and act on an emergency basis. Uh, so this is what happens when we don't listen to doctors or doctors or people don't give us the right advice or we don't listen. Uh, things happen too little too late. So um, a huge problem with how we communicate this decade coming up has got to be the biggest change in human history and we communicate it as if it's 1980. Uh, this is a report, UBC has done some fantastic work. I just found this UBC report on one of the circular tables last night and this is what happens to most of these reports. Somebody has probably read it with what I call their thumb rather than their eyes. They then put it down and it ends up in a recycling bin uh, very quickly. The 20 to 30 revolution, if it happens, will not be reported in PowerPoint, PDF, Excel spreadsheets and similar documents that we use. So my company Figbytes helps organizations to be able to build a future proofing map. Bill, you might say it's not future proofing, they're not doing enough, and you're probably right, but they're trying. Uh, so we create this living roadmap to the future presented uh, with the performance presented in pictures rather than a small book that most stakeholders will never read. Um, we engaged with the state of Minnesota in uh, early 2018. The state of Minnesota represents the perfect bipolarity of the US right now, uh, led by a stable genius. Uh, we have a perfect situation of bipolarity with 25 US states declaring that they are in on the Paris Accord and 25 states saying they're out. Minnesota is one of those 25, but how could they navigate massive transformation with something like this or its electronic equivalent? So we have brought this plan alive, uh, as we say, uh, in software. Now this is an external website. Um, you know, normally we don't like people looking on their mobiles as we present, but if you want to come in here, uh, and there is a URL somewhere, I thought there was a URL. Uh, it's sustainability.mn.gov. This site is linked directly to the underlying data from 24 government departments. Each government head or department head has uh, signed a letter to say that they will report monthly. Uh, the data are updated monthly so people can see the progress in close to real time. This is the equivalent of GPS. Uh, this type of thing and the spreadsheets and the PowerPoint underneath it are the equivalent of trying to uh, navigate your way up a stormy mountain with a wet, soggy map and a, a compass that's kind of uh, condensed over that you can't read. So this is real-time communication now. Um, now, these are 24 government departments. They're going to bring in all the cities, all the schools and all the hospitals uh, sequentially. And this will be the first truly joined up plan. Our goal is uh, at COP26 in Glasgow next year uh, that Glasgow uh, is showing its plan. It's linked to a Scottish plan, a uh, Welsh plan, who have both declared climate emergencies, hopefully a UK plan once they lift their, their heads out of their Brexit protology. Uh, and wouldn't it be wonderful if the representatives of this room were able to produce a city from each continent so that we could show Greta at, at COP26 that there are signs of dawning intelligence amongst the uh, elders of the planet. Thank you. So now uh, we want to take some time for some questions from the audience. So could you please go to a microphone? And we're just going to move quickly to the Q&A. Yes. Could you start, please? Uh, just say your name and ask your question. Um, okay, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Franklin Liao, and I'm a student at BCIT. Should we be prepared for the great dying of humanity, then? I'm going to, I'm going to say it fine and simple. We're probably facing a situation where uh, things are unsustainable as it is. Give, given, what, well, given the current trajectory, it's not likely that we'll turn our way away from the brink. So should city become bastions as if we are facing the end of Pax Romana again? Thank you. Who would like to address that very briefly? Can you repeat it? I didn't hear what, what you said. Was it a question? Should we be preparing for the end of civilization? It kind of sounded like that was the question. 
We should be preparing to avoid the end of civilization, but we're not doing those kinds of things. It's one thing to say, this is possible, or there are great opportunities in urbanization, but to translate those into effective policies that turn those words into real opportunities is a completely different situation. That's what my last slide was all about. Mostly we hear talk, 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 but it's not, it's not possible with any existing policy discussion to turn those opportunities into something real that means a massive reduction in our ecological footprint and our energy consumption, while at the same time maintaining the stability of the system in which we live. We need a grand master plan to, uh, in effect, degrow to the point where we can uh, stabilize within the means of nature. And that's nowhere being discussed seriously on this planet. It's all about how technology will keep the machine going more or less on its current course. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to move to the second question and have uh, somebody else answer it. Yes, go ahead. Okay. You want the solution? It's right here. I applied as a speaker. I got a 10-minute slot yesterday at the end of the day where there was about 10 people in the room. They sort of understood it. What is the question? The question is, why don't people listen when the solution is presented? And you're not listening either, okay? Anyone? I'm asking the question, why don't you want the solution? I'm a design engineer. I practice systems engineering design, applying urban design and ecology together. Okay, we'll take an you know, answer. You, you, from, you, you, we you, need to move to the, you, to you the see, panelists you're, now. You're pushing it off because you don't want a solution. I don't uh, have a PhD. I'm not a narrow-minded person. I'm not myopic. Could I speak with you after the session? You thank can you. Do, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the next question, please, in the back. Hi, thank you. Um, I was curious, uh, Dr. Reese sort of spoke to it about the, uh, the financial and the market sort of piece or uh, the lack of, an, uh, of true willingness, but you do see some market trends shifting towards, um, you know, more environmentally sort of friendly investments. Uh, you know, I know Norway uh, is, uh, has, the, the pension funds have stopped investing in the Alberta oil sands. Uh, socially responsible investments are picking up on, uh, on the stock exchanges. I was just wondering if you thought that there is a bit of a shift in the market because at the end of the day money talks and that's what you spoke to. Is there a bit of a shift that we're seeing in some of the private forces that will hopefully build momentum in this area? Somebody um, <clears throat> calling? Yeah, there's, there's no question there's a shift taking place. Um, let's not beat around the bush. We're on the Titanic. We're moving deck chairs around, and maybe we've turned the wheel a few spokes. Uh, we need massive, massive transformation. We are still uh, subsidizing fossil fuels more than renewables. Why are we subsidizing fossil fuels? And we're doing it in this country. And we need to get out in the streets and act as if there is emergency and stop this happening. We should stop paying our taxes. If that's where our taxes are going, don't pay them. Bring the government down. Bring corporations down that are destroying the planet. Greta is right. <laughs> Stop being polite and get the hell on with this. Yes, on microphone three. Hi. Um, so I guess it's more in a consumer perspective, but um, I do believe that a sustainable lifestyle is more of a privilege uh, that people become aware of because if you're in the lines of or threshold of poverty You don't really have that privilege to adapt to a sustainable lifestyle So how would you propose that those who are in that lower? Uh, income bracket adapt to a more sustainable lifestyle The people in the lower income brackets are in a sustainable lifestyle much more so than any of us in this room, I would wager. It, anyone else at the panel want to make a quick comment to that, please? Uh, well, no, I was just going to say exactly the same thing. One of the things that averages mask is the gross inequities that are happening even within our own cities. So uh, I euphemistically say in Vancouver, uh, sustainable lifestyle is a closet dwelling vegan on a bicycle. And uh, really, it is, it is true that uh, 
income is very much correlated to sustainability. So it's, uh, it's really for us who are the over consumers to consume less. We don't have to worry about what people who are already consuming less are doing. If anything, they have the right to consume a little more. Thank you. Can I, I do want to say one more thing. We do have to look at the population question. Because if we increase populations by 40%, and then there's much less biocapacity for every person on the planet. So it means even the people who are now living sustainable lifestyles will have to reduce more. Unsustainability is the product of overconsumption multiplied by the number of people. Both are factors we have to redistribute while reducing population. If we're not doing that, we're not being serious about this problem. Diego, yes. and then Doug. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not in response to the question, but to engage with, with the rest of the panel. But uh, when we were producing the, the GEO6, uh, I was in, in, the, in the driver's uh, chapter that deals with population. And many times we were called neo-Malthusians because we were trying to bring forward the population issue. So uh, it's still, there's still quite a resistance, uh, even uh, among scientists. So, so it's, it, it is an issue that needs to be brought forward, and it's not an easy one. But considering the, the, the current situation in which we're in, uh, the projected growth in, in population, uh, I am assuming that we agree in this panel that cities play an enormous role, and we are not trying to tell you uh, move away from cities. Uh, it's uh, probably the other way around. There's a lot more chances of having a more sustainable lifestyle living in cities, and I think that needs to be uh, clear as well. Thank you. Doug? Yeah, I, just, I would just reflect back on what Paul Hawkins said yesterday when he looked, there was the slide, and it had one of the, the third, was it? The third, which said educate young women, and then the fourth said uh, family planning. So then the question, if, and that would, if you combine those two, you get that to the number one issue. So then the question is, how do you get there? And the, the way to get there is to improve the living conditions of young people, of these people. I mean, you cannot, that's most times when overpopulation happens is it's an insurance policy. You have five, six kids, they're the one, they're, because there's no social safety net. So we, I think we have to be humane about it. We have to also make sure, I mean, we can bring up the overpopulation issue, but you have to steer away from neutering, you know, making sure people, you know, how do you force people not to have, have children? You have to give them incentives not to. And I'm, that's, not, that says, that's not meaning that you have to give them tons of riches and everything and everyone have a car and whatever, but you need to have the basics. The basic, you know, basic health care, basic education, and so on, and a focus on young women. Thank you. Um, microphone one, Holly. Hi. My name is Holly Pearson. I'm an urban planner, and I was very interested in Jenny Moore's comment about um, that uh, the criteria for improvement of development permits and business permits should be whether that project is helping to advance um, real sustainability goals, one planet type goals. My question is, uh, are you aware of any efforts anywhere in the world to create a development code, a local municipal ordinance that has those kinds of criteria embedded in it? It would be a, a really radical uh, change from what's typically, you know, what development codes are based on. Thank you. All right, well, I am aware of uh, where this was tackled in the 1990s. Uh, it was a recommendation in the Clouds of Change report, and for several years after that was adopted here in Vancouver, anything that came forward had to have a condition where staff had to comment on how it was impacting the carbon budget for the city for a development proposal. I think that's um, not necessarily, well, maybe now with the climate emergency, it's coming back. Um, there are uh, exercises around checklists um, and uh, but checklists can be manipulated, right? So uh, I'm not uh, entirely aware. I think there are initiatives out there, but um, I, you know, it's very hard as a municipal government when you're looking at the opportunity to develop your tax base in the short term uh, to really think hard about and to even be feeling like you're authorized to make those decisions. So I think we have a much bigger opportunity here to get much more serious about whether or not development is actually contributing to the reductions that we want to see, both in climate and the social equity increases that we want to see, and also the business piece. I, I think that uh, certainly here, we, we have an opportunity to do more. Yeah, so yeah, short answer, no, I don't know. <laughs> 
Um, I, my, the clock here says five minutes, but it said five minutes for the past 15 minutes. So <laughs> how many more minutes do we really have? Five to ten. Five to ten. Uh, 9.45, so we're, we're pretty much at time. Maybe we're pretty much at time. I think we have one more question here at the far <laughs> back of the room. Could you please pose your question? Yes, thank you. My name is Beth Sanders. I am a fourth generation settler, um, warmly welcomed by the Musqueam people, which is now known as Treaty 6 territory in Canada. Um, you'll all know my home is Edmonton. I'd like to make an observation this morning, and that is, I think the choir is in the room. And I think the opportunity for us while we're gathered here is to find ways to connect with each other so we can leave to do the work we'd like to do. And I'd like to make the observation that the panel and the speakers and all of us as listeners is a mode of meeting and gathering that is business as usual. One of the best things we can do to improve the health of a system is to connect as many parts of it as possible. So the format that we're in is actually reinforcing the trap that we're in. So I highly encourage people that while we are in this trap that we have made for ourselves in the four walls of this room, in chairs all lined up to listen to a handful of people, that we also just take the moves to introduce ourselves to people and connect people to people despite the fact that we're in a structure that does not serve us well. And I know that wasn't really a question, and I'm welcome to hearing feedback from the panelists. Well, I really Thanks. thank you for your observation, and I think it's um, absolutely correct that we need to find many different ways to uh, connect with each other, and I hope that throughout the, in the margins and the hallways that we take those opportunities to heart. Um, I know that we are at time, and I wanna thank the panelists for their patience as I sort of rushed through the panel, apologies. I did want to try to get as many questions as possible from the audience. Um, there is one housekeeping um, thing before we move on and, and head into the breakout sessions. And Vanessa, if you are here, could you please help me with that? Because I can't remember um, exactly which session we need to note. Thanks. Yeah. No worries, thanks. Um, so the second session that's on, on our online program was missing the room number, so I figured out that it's room 118, and I just want to confirm that as you go, it's the biogeophysical one, it didn't have a room number on it, so I think that's 118, but I looked to the conference organizers. It yeah. just seemed to align. Okay, if you are going to that yeah. session, okay. do not give up. It is room happening. I just heard it confirmed. Room 118. Yeah. All right, let's give um, all of the speakers a big round of applause. Confirmed. Thank you all for coming. So what do you think, Jim?